so I'll be speaking about cybersecurity, but really more accurately, I'll be talking about how we can talk about cybersecurity. Obviously, the threats that we face when it comes to cybersecurity keep evolving. In some ways, the challenges we face have remained at a high level constant over the last few decades. But the tactics that cyber criminals employ continue to evolve. And what we know, of course, is that cyber criminals increasingly target people. So what we must do is think about how we communicate with people. We must put people more at the heart of our approach to cybersecurity. Because really, it's only by helping people understand cybersecurity and helping to shift them to practicing more positive security behaviors that we can build more secure communities, more secure companies, and ultimately more secure countries. So I have been on a mission for the, over the last 10 years to really shine a light on the human side of cybersecurity. When I say the term cybersecurity to you, what springs to mind? You're probably thinking about data. You're probably thinking about hackers. You're probably thinking about code. You're thinking about technology, connectivity, internet-enabled devices, maybe smart cities. But of course, it's also very much about people. And this has been the focus of my work for over 10 years, particularly focusing on awareness, behavior, and culture, helping organizations around the world understand their security culture, and helping to engage people in more positive security behaviors. My background is in sociology, politics, civic design, and so I bring all of these fields into understanding cybersecurity. Ten years ago, when I would meet colleagues within my own industry and say that I worked on the people side of cybersecurity, I would usually be met with a blank face. And if someone was feeling brave, they would ask, what does that mean? As an industry, we were not focused on people ten years ago. But I'm pleased to say that that has grown and changed, particularly over the last couple of years. As, as an industry, we've accepted, of course, that people are at the heart of cybersecurity just as much as technology. Technology does not attack technology by itself. There is, at least in 99% of the time, always a human being involved in one way or another. And moreover, we do not protect information for the sake of that information itself. We protect it for our livelihoods. We protect it for our personal information. We protect it sometimes for our health and our physical safety. So if we think about the life cycle of data, of technology, of information, then we can understand that, of course, people are central at every stage. It is a human being designing, developing, building technology. It's human beings who test it. So, of course, we have to think there about mistakes that can be made, about malice, about motivation, about bias. Then, of course, it's people who are using technology, and it's people who are abusing technology. What makes somebody become a hacker? What makes somebody become an ethical legal hacker or a criminal hacker? What are their motivations? What are their methods? All very deeply human elements. And then, of course, there is no more important part of the human side of cybersecurity than the impact. What we have seen in recent years is attacks on critical national infrastructure, on power plants, on hospitals, on schools, on universities, as well, of course, as on companies, individuals, critical national infrastructure, and governments. So the impact is very deeply human, too. The more connected we become, arguably, the more vulnerable we become. So it's fundamental that we communicate this subject to everybody. Most people have a life that touches technology in one way or another. So we need to think about actually how we shape this so that people engage, feel more empowered, feel more confident, feel more able to practice cybersecurity. Let's take a step back. I mentioned the attack groups, the people who are carrying out cybercrime and cyber activity. And I want to take a moment to just think about 
who those individuals and those groups are. Where does the threat exist? Well, of course, um, we cannot escape the nation state. It's very much on our minds, it's very much in the press, very much the attention of the moment is around nation state level cyber activity. Up until about 2016, this was not something that we particularly talked about in the public domain. The fact that states were attacking states online was not something that generally we heard much about in the media. That all changed in 2016, 2017, and of course, we're hearing more and more about this. Nation state level attacks, the Advanced Persistent Threat, or the APT, grabs headlines. The truth is, that's a small percentage of the challenges that we face. The issue is that the damage, the impact from nation state level attacks can be so severe. Nation state level attacks, like pretty much any other, usually start in the same way. A country, a state, a government does not want to use their most pressured resources to carry out a cyber attack if they can avoid it. So they will start with social engineering. They'll start with a phishing email. The difference is, if they don't succeed, then they will move to more advanced and more persistent measures. They will have the money, the time, the determination, the resource, and the motivation to become more advanced in their techniques. Unlike, generally, organized criminal gangs who are financially motivated. Financially motivated, organized criminal gangs are the reason we have seen such a huge phenomenal growth in cyber activity. This is individuals and groups who were carrying out crime anyway, but they have realized that it is easier, faster, cheaper, less risky, more likely to succeed if they carry out their crime online, at least in some capacity. So, for most organizations, this is the bulk of the threat. For most individuals, this is where cybersecurity touches us. Then we have the hacktivists. The clues in the name, the hacking activists. So, individuals, collectives, groups who are not motivated by money, but have usually a political or social motivation, ideology. When I started in the industry over 10 years ago, they were a very large problem. What we saw over the following years was law enforcement making huge advances in disrupting their activity. So there was about a 90% reduction in what they were carrying out um, since about 2014. That's changed a little bit over the last year or so. And of course, people who specialize in this area, researchers who particularly follow hacktivism, predict that we are going to see more. As we see more social unrest, of course, as more people have engaged in technology over the last couple of years, it's likely that we're going to see more and more hacktivism. We then have the script kiddies a term that perhaps people are not so familiar with. A script kiddie I like to think of as a have-a-go hacker. Research shows that they generally fit the stereotype, and they're pretty much the only group that generally fits the stereotype we usually see in the media. So generally, they are younger. Often, they are teenagers, and often, they are male. They are generally carrying out their activity without much of a acceptance or comprehension that what they're doing is crime. They usually are motivated by ego, by kudos. They want to show off to their friends. But they should not be underestimated. They've been behind some of the biggest attacks we have seen in recent years. All of those groups so far external to an organization. But of course, many issues, in fact, most issues, come from within an organization or at least combined with an external actor. There will be some element of an insider. When I say insider, usually people jump to thinking about the malicious insider. And the psychology of a malicious insider is fascinating. I can and do do full sessions just talking about malicious insiders. Because usually they are people who have been very loyal in an organization. They usually do not fit your idea of somebody who would steal information and use it for their own purposes. 
but they are usually disgruntled. They feel that they have been done a wrong by their organization, and so they seek to attack and steal information to, um, to try and right this wrong. We then have non-malicious insiders. Non-malicious insiders are the bulk of insiders. They are people who just make a mistake. And usually, in all honesty, there is a problem with the system. The technology has not been built to be human-centric. They have not been trained. They're overworked, they're stressed, they're busy, and they make a mistake. And then running alongside all of this, we have the supply chain. So this is where we're seeing more and more attacks can be carried out with any of these groups, um, but they target a smaller organization as a way of pivoting and getting to a larger organization that the smaller organization works with. I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of very recent news stories. Of course, every day we hear more and more about cybersecurity, or should I say cyber insecurity, in the news. And these are a couple of issues I just wanted to bring to your attention. They highlight some of the things I was speaking about on the last uh, slide. So firstly, we have the Lapsus Group. You may have heard a bit about, over the last week or so, a cybercrime group that came to attention because they claimed attacks on Microsoft, on Okta, of course, a huge, very credible um, security company, on NVIDIA, so huge tech companies around the world, and Lapsus have been carrying out attacks on them and claiming these attacks on social media. Among their techniques is to use social engineering, particularly over the phone, so manipulating employees working at those organizations, supply chain activities, and also targeting people working within the organization. In some cases, targeting people to become insiders, offering to pay them in exchange for access. And as I spoke about script kiddies, there seems to be an element of script kiddies here involved in this group. Carried out huge attacks, and yet it seems potentially that a teenager from Oxford in the UK is the leader or at least highly involved in this group. Said to have amassed 14 million um, US dollars in Bitcoin through this activity and was identified when a rival hacker posted their details online. So watch this space. We'll see where that one goes. The other story I wanted to draw your attention was around Nestle. Anonymous, again, hacktivist group, claiming that they stole a huge amount of data from Nestle that appeared online. It included in, um, internal email, customer information. Anonymous said they did this to protest Nestle not removing themselves um, from Russia. And then Nestle turned around and said, no, that wasn't you. That was actually us. We made a mistake a few months ago, and the data was leaked internally, um, so we're not letting you have that kudos. They would rather admit to having made the mistake themselves. So I talk about the human element. I've mentioned social engineering, and all the research in recent years shows that social engineering is very much at the heart of many cyber attacks. Phishing, still the number one vector. Now, when I talk about social engineering, when I talk about phishing, this is where we are manipulated into unwittingly doing something or saying something, giving away information, clicking on a link, downloading an attachment, thinking that we can trust the person um, who is contacting us. They are masquerading to be somebody that we can trust. When it comes to social engineering, I say that the right fish at the wrong time can catch any of us. It's easy for us to think, well, that would never happen to me. I would never just blindly trust an email apparently coming from my CEO. I would never click that link, transfer that money. But it's not true. We can all be manipulated. And this is because most social engineering attacks take advantage of human bias. So, for example, I've shared one that we received at Sygenta. Um, your password is going to expire. Often security is now used against us. We have phone calls pretending to be from the bank's anti-fraud department saying, your account's been compromised, I need your details, I need your help. So it's preying on our fears. It's preying on our curiosity. The other message I've included, um, you have been featured among the worst people to be on Instagram.
And the fish goes even further than that, saying, you can see who added you to it. So it makes it very hard for us to resist. In fact, what this social engineering does is it clouds our judgment. So if we look to behavioral economics, we can understand that human beings have two ways of processing information. The slow, rational way, where we think through what we're doing very carefully, very calmly, and we think before we act. We then have the fast way of thinking, where our judgment is clouded, we're feeling emotional, we are impulsive, and we act before we think. What social engineering does by making us feel scared, flattered, or curious, is it pushes us into the fast way of thinking. So we're not thinking clearly, we click that link, we download that attachment, we transfer that money, and only after we have done that does the penny drop, and we realize that maybe we were manipulated. This can be similar to thinking about misinformation and disinformation, which also preys on our emotions, also impersonates somebody we may trust. It also takes advantage of existing conspiracy theories. It takes advantage of polarized views and pushes people into further and further polarization, discrediting experts, and of course, carrying out trolling, manipulation online. As human beings, we often don't take the time to actually analyze and think rationally whether to trust information or not. But when we do think through whether to trust a source or trust information, we go through certain steps. We think about whether um, that information is compatible with known information, information that we already believe in. How credible do we think the source is? Do other people that I know and trust believe it? This is why social media is so powerful when it comes to the spreading of misinformation and disinformation, because often it is spread within our network by people we either know and trust who are unwittingly spreading it, or by accounts that look like ones we favor. Now, when it comes to talking about cybersecurity, we face a big challenge. I said at the start, the threats continue to grow, and that is not going to change. We're facing a set of very complicated, interconnected problems when it comes to cybersecurity. But when we just talk about the threat, what we do is we alienate the people that we are communicating with. And this is partly because for many people who do not feel that they are technologists, who do not feel deeply informed about technology or about security, it can feel overwhelming. And particularly as we hear about more and more attacks that are happening. As time has gone on over the last 10 years, certainly we have seen more and more public attacks. Every day that goes by, pretty much we hear about a new cyber attack, a new incident. So this can feel very overwhelming, and many people can feel, well, the hackers have won. When I'm communicating with an audience, when I'm raising awareness about cybersecurity, I'm very conscious that I'm talking to people who have come into the room, maybe already with an elevated level of fear. They already feel emotional. And so when we're talking about something scary, particularly to people who maybe already feel anxious about this topic, we cannot focus on the threat. We must focus very much on what people can do to better protect themselves. We must make them aware of the threat, but decades of research in psychology has shown that we need to empower people by helping them understand what they can do to protect themselves. And this ties in with research in neuroscience that shows about 80% of people around the world are wired towards optimism in their personal lives. They may feel pessimistic about the world around them, but it is human nature to think that we are going to be fine. We think that we will never be divorced, that we will never be ill, and we will never be hacked. So if we simply focus on the negative messages when it comes to security, we alienate people who think that applies to everyone else. That doesn't apply to me. No one's going to hack me. I'm going to be just fine. So we need to make cybersecurity accessible. We need to not just talk about the why, but the why me. We need to make sure we frame the messages so that people feel engaged, inspired, and empowered. 
And as part of this, it's about looking at the security culture that we have, the values that people have internally and in an organization, the perceptions that they have around cybersecurity, their levels of awareness, and how they behave, the behaviors that they practice, and the behaviors that they think are acceptable. We need to help build up a mindset. So when it comes to cybersecurity, it's not so much about giving people the list of things they should and should not do. It's about empowering them with an educated mindset. For example, when it comes to social engineering, not to be thinking about whether it's come from a particular email address, not to be telling them to hover over the link and see if it's accurate, which people cannot do on a mobile phone, one of the many problems with it. Instead, we need to think about building up their mindset and helping them understand an unexpected communication that makes you feel something and asks you to do something, that is the red flag when it comes to whether you're being manipulated or not. And of course, that applies to misinformation and disinformation as well. Of course, there are technological answers in partnership with platforms that we can build upon. But research also shows that actually encouraging people to take a mindset where they have critical thinking around information, where they are nudged to think about whether information is accurate, this is one of our best forms of defense. So for my session today, I really want to help you think more about people when it comes to cybersecurity, to understand that social engineering work because, works because it subverts trust and it exploits human bias. And misinformation, disinformation are essentially social engineering at scale. They work for the same principles. To shift this, we need to build a more positive and proactive set of engagement. We need to look at culture, education, and mindset. We need to empower, educate, and engage people, and focus on building up their self-efficacy, their confidence, their behaviors, rather than simply scaring them about the threat. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. If anybody would like any more information, the references that I've spoken about today, please do get in touch. Thank you so much.